New York's Classic Rock, Q1043. And I welcome Governor Jim McGreevy. The last time I saw him, he actually was the governor, and he joined our morning show when we were in a different location. We were in Midtown, I believe, at the time. Maybe we were. I don't remember. I get it confused. But I'm so happy to see you again. You're oh, looking healthy. You. It's great to see you. We're doing this by Zoom in today's world. And the reason I asked Governor Jim McGreevy to join us is that he has been since, well, I guess for the last 13 years, working yeah. on behalf of prisoners and prisoner rights. And most recently, you've been working with New Jersey Reentry. First of all, how are you doing in the pandemic? Is everybody healthy? Is everybody safe? How are you? Yes, everybody's healthy. And my 92-year-old father, thank goodness for sisters, um, he's doing really well. He's an old sort of grizzled Marine Corps veteran, but he's doing really well. And my daughters are doing well. And, and uh, I actually had the, the, the virus much earlier. Um, it was negligible uh, impact. And so I'm just blessed to, to be careful and to get out there. And, and obviously working with a lot of our, the people that we serve, our program participants, have had either in prison or back into the community. They confront uh, COVID, the virus, and the after effects. And so it's, it's Shelly, it's working to make sure people have access to medicine quickly, people have access to pharmacology quickly. And so it's just the importance of those wraparound services, but particularly access to medical and health care. And you really value that now. You're, you're acutely aware of I mean, I come, my mother was a registered nurse, my sister's a nurse, and, and I've always been around, my brother-in-law's a doctor, but I, you just really value access to healthcare, respecting the pipelines, the emergency department, what doctors, what nurses, what healthcare professionals do. But it's not something, you know, we, we typically only think about healthcare when there's an emergency, but now it's so much more a part of our life. And so I'm just grateful for all those who serve. What does New Jersey reentry do? Great question. I love it. Um, what we do is is that you know people are coming out of prison every day. People are coming out of jails every day. So if if I can to give you sort of the nickel sketch is that there are people that are quote unquote max outs. Those are people that Shelley have served the entirety of their sentence uh, for whatever reason they were denied parole. So whether they were sentenced for 20 years or 20 months, they're coming out and literally with virtually no support. Then there are those that are on parole. So the state parole board says, all right, McGreevy, uh, you were sentenced to seven years. Uh, you've been exercising good behavior. So we're going to release you in three and a half years. So that's parole. So max out parole. Then you have people that have been in county jails and in, you see county jails all over the state of New Jersey or New York or Connecticut. And those are people that serve typically in county jail less than a year. Less than a year, you're in the county. More than a year, you're in state prison. And so people, the same way you have probation for a state, you have parole for state prison, you have probation for county jails, you're going to get out earlier. And then something called drug court. Drug court is a diversionary program, so I have a history of drug abuse, a history of substance abuse. Instead of putting me into prison, you're going to help me with treatment to keep me out of prison for a five-year program. We work very closely with the addicted community and then people coming out of the federal prison system. So it's max out, stay parole out of state prison, uh, county probation, county jails, drug court, and the federal prison system. So we have five different streams. We have 9,000 clients. We have eight different sites in central and northern New Jersey, and we provide a host of services, everything from connecting people to addiction treatment, uh, healthcare on hepatitis B and C, diabetes, HIV, mental health, uh, depression, anxiety, grappling with the pharmacology, and then legal services. I mean, we have a whole cadre who work with identification. Think of what it would be like if Shelley were dropped in the middle of any New Jersey or New York community without an ID. You can't have access to state benefits. You can't have access to a job. You can't have access to an apartment without identification 
in America today, you're almost helpless. So we work with um, the legal community to help secure persons, what we call a motor vehicle commission ID or license. In fact, on Monday, 102 of our clients are getting a license, uh, MVC license or identification at our Newark facility. So ID, ID, ID is so critically important. And then we connect people to housing and lastly, training and employment. You don't want to put person in a warehouse. Shell, that's going to last for 90 days. It's backbreaking work. You're going to get tired of that after six months. So we try to move people towards careers. And whether it's HVAC or commercial driver's license, uh, or now we're looking at the cannabis industry, so much we try to get people into what we call ladders of opportunity so that you have a career the same way you would want a career or I would want a career for myself or my daughters. It's helping people have a career so they're vested in doing things healthy and well. It seems to me that is the greatest challenge because on a job application, isn't the question asked if you have committed a crime and isn't there just immediately a roadblock for most of these people? Or is that not the case anymore? Well, that's not the case in New Jersey, but it's not, it's the case nationally. I mean, people say they want to know your background, your criminal history. And, and now we, now employers can do that search um, just prior to hiring. So at the end of the day, if Jim McGreevy has a criminal history, they, I won't check a box. So they know that right off, but you know, maybe on the second interview or just beforehand, Obviously, I can do a criminal background check. So, but part of the challenge is, Shell, is to make sure that our clients are trained. At the end of the day, if I have Cisco certification for a computer programming job, or I have a CDL for a driver's license, I'm, whether it's UPS or whether it's Wakefern or whether it's Panasonic or Blue Cross Blue Shield, it's trying to make sure that the people we serve have the, the highest level of skills. So yes, I may have had an addiction history, I may have had a criminal history, but now I'm maintaining my sobriety, I wanna work hard and I wanna make that commitment. And I think you see that in our ability to provide skill-based training for those positions. I am speaking with ex-New Jersey Governor Jim McGreevy. He now works with New Jersey Reentry. You can uh, check them out at njreentry.org. Why has this become your passion? Well, you know, it, it's just like in New Jersey, Shell, there's such a there's such a correlation between addiction and incarceration. And people have to understand that. I mean, I'll make the argument that, you know, during the 80s when the crack cocaine epidemic was largely in communities of color, I mean, people said this is all law enforcement. And then the reality is, is today, whether it's opioids, whether it's fentanyl, that came out of lovely the, the majority community. And so basically people were abusing Percocets, people were abusing opioids. And so then they abused prescription medicine and then they went to heroin and then they went to synthetic opioids called fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger. And then there's something called car fentanyl, which is even stronger. In fact, in Africa, it takes down a full grown bull elephant in 20 minutes. Think of what happens when that's coursing through the veins of a 108 pound young woman. And I never so, even heard of that type of fentanyl. Oh, it, it's, it's brutal. And so what, what happens in terms of the opioid world is, is if you first got hooked by virtue of Percocets and opioids, a lot of these young people tragically are, are chasing the next great high. And each package of, op of heroin is stamped. And so the sad reality is if that somebody dies or somebody's subject to an overdose, many people will think that they will get past that high and they'll literally want to use that packet. And so what we understand is the importance of we provide connections to whether medication assisted treatment. So opioids and fentanyl in particular are so difficult to overcome. And so we work with providers, whether it's Rutgers Medical School, whether it's any number of providers to help people access Suboxone or Vivitrol. And the whole goal is, is that when I'm trying to come off of heroin, when I'm trying to come off of fentanyl, I actually need help. 
And so we have utilized Suboxone, if you will, as a, as a bridge of sobriety to a healthier place. So how I got this, when, when, when I was in seminary, I was sent up to Harlem, a place called Exodus Ministries. And you know from, in fact, um, last night was the first night of Hanukkah, but, but you, you know that in the book of Exodus, it's, it's leaving slavery to go to the promised land. And the whole goal of the Exodus transitional ministry was, was the leaving a place of incarceration and living right, making healthy choices, making responsible choices. But to do that, you need an ID. To do that, you need access to housing. To do that, you need in those first 30 to 45 days. Think of what it'd be like, Shell, if you or me were just dropped out into any community without an ID, without a bed, without food, without health care, and in many places without somebody who loves us. So if you have nothing and you're hungry at night three, you're going to return to what you know, which is tragically running, gunning, and doping. And so what I, you know, what I, I just try to say, and this isn't a Republican or Democratic issue, which what I love about the space that I'm in, because whether it's the Koch brothers nationally on prison reentry, or whether it's Republicans or Democrats, people understand that if 98% of the people are going to come out of prison, and nationally 66% recidivate, that's not a good stat. And I'm proud in terms of our st statistics, less than 10% of our clients are reincarcerated. But that means it's a lot of hard work. It means making sure they have access to addiction treatment because if they are using in an irresponsible way without the support of Suboxone or Vivitrol medication assisted treatment, they're gonna supply that, that habit. Making sure they have access to healthcare. Um, and that's why it's important they have Medicaid, but whether it's hepatitis or diabetes or HIV, making sure they have access to mental health care. So when they confront that depression or that, that anxiety that they have the support. And then also making sure they're in structured sober housing, having their ID, and then giving them into a training program that's gonna make sure, Shelley, at the end of the day, that's a real job. That's a real job, that's a ladder of opportunity that they can build upon. I, I just wanna ask you about one other thing because sure. I mean, you have overcome scandal in your lifetime very, very publicly. You were a member of the LGBTQ community by virtue of scandal because you were forced out of office having an extramarital affair as governor with another man. How did you rebuild your psyche, your emotions, Great and your question. life after that? Great question. I mean, for me, um, one, it's having good mental health. I mean, I, I went to, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna out my psychiatrist. Um, not, he, he, by the way, so I went to a friend of mine, happens to be a Jesuit priest, and I said, I want the smartest, oldest, wisest guy. And he gave me to a great doctor who's at uh, Albert Einstein at Yeshiva. And um, he great, gave me to, to somebody who was, and he's, he's well published. Um, and so I would say it's three things. It's one, learning to be yourself. Uh, learning to be yourself, learning that we are all precious and valuable and living into our own truth. And that's so critically important. Whoever we are, I believe, I mean, it sounds maybe old fashioned, but I believe that we're all unique, we're all different. And that's part of the, the glorious nature of creation. So it's to be yourself. Secondly, it's about service. It's about doing something for others. When I was up at Exodus Transitional Ministry, we would work with guys who had just come out of, whether it was Sing Sing or federal prison or state prisons. And a lot of them back then, Shell, I mean, some of these sentences were so long. They were egregious. They were drug sentences. People were sentenced for the old Rockefeller laws. And we would take them up to Harlem and there was a soup kitchen. And these guys would be ladling soup or ladling food for sometimes for young children. And all of a sudden when they got out of themselves 
and into serving food for some like five or six or seven year old kid who had done nothing wrong in his or her life except to be born where they were born, except to be hungry. You get out of yourself and you understand out of a sense of compassion, other people's pain or other people's challenges. So the second thing is service. It's sort of giving yourself passionately to helping other people fulfill who and what they are. And for me, the third thing is gratitude. I mean, I, there, I have so much gratitude in my life. I have gratitude for this interview. Interview. I have gratitude for Shelley. I have gratitude for communicating. Some God willing, somebody who may be addicted um, will get you into treatment within 24 hours in terms of New Jersey reentry, or somebody who maybe just came out of prison, or some mother, um, or some father, or some wife, or some husband. Uh, so it's also gratitude for your family, gratitude for the gift of life. I mean, I I worked with the women for. Uh, three and a half years in, in behind the wall, and we would talk about things. And I'll, I, I don't want to take, but one woman said one day, I'll never forget it, and it gave me chills, and I was actually concerned. She said I was, she was grateful for the gift of HIV, and I was like concerned. And I said, you know, I wanted to tease that out, parse that. And she said, Jim, I was always running and gunning and being destructive. And now I know every day of life is precious. I know every day of life is sacred. I don't know how much I have, she goes, but every day, every breath is meaningful to me. And so for her, that was her truth and her sense of gratitude. And so I think, you know, if anything good has come out of COVID and, and we're here now, it causes us to, to be a little slower, to be God willing, a little more reflective and to understand that we have an abundance of gifts. So it's, it's to live into your own truth. It's to be of service to others and to be grateful for the abundance in our, our life. And that, that basically we have everything we need in our lives um, to be fulfilled and, and, to have that sense of gratitude. And I'm sorry, we have run out of time. Thank you oh, so much. Jim, Kelly, thank you. Ex-governor of New Jersey. Q104, thank you. New York's classic rock, Q104.3.